Standing on the side of the Pearl River Bridge, looking down 150 feet into the deep valley below, Larry Jaroke, who's just a regular guy, is thinking about jumping off. But... Before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place. So, if that's of interest to you, please tell the like button that you're sorry for everything you've ever done, but with your fist. Okay, let's get into today's story. In 2008, Larry went home to his girlfriend Vivian and told her the heartbreaking news that he was just laid off. Larry had worked for an airline catering company called Jet Chefs for seven years, but due to the economy, they had to cut some people, and Larry was one of them. Larry met his girlfriend Vivian in 2002 at a poison concert that she was reviewing. Fast forward to being unemployed for several months now, Larry landed a job at an auto parts warehouse and one night he was talking to his boss named Mario about high school. They had gone to the same high school. Mario was graduating while Larry was just a freshman. When Larry was in high school, he was in the PA club, which is similar to having a morning radio show, and before long, his voice was recognizable, and people always told him he had a personality and voice for radio. But that was back in high school. Larry wanted to be a welder after high school, but those thoughts were disregarded after his father was killed in a factory accident. His mother would die just four years later of a severe heart attack. His parents would leave him the small, two-bedroom house in their will. Late one night, Larry and Vivian were watching television when a commercial came on advertising for the Stockton Center for Broadcasting, and after a quick conversation, Larry decided this is something he needed to pursue. The next morning, Larry and Vivian went to the school, and before long, Larry was on a tour of the campus with a retired program director as his guide. Later that afternoon, Larry and Vivian went back home and started making arrangements to accommodate both his job and school. Larry called Mario at the auto parts warehouse and told him the good news, and he was willing to work out a schedule for Larry as well. So, a couple weeks later, Larry was in broadcasting school, and a couple months after that, internships open up for radio stations. A woman named Destiny walked into the classroom and said that an internship just opened up for a local radio morning show named Grover's Morning Drive. Larry went to an Italian restaurant with Vivian to tell her the news of applying for an internship. Vivian, with her knowledge of the show from her reporting days, warns him of their shock jock style where they mix drama with current events. After the date, Larry and Vivian proceed to the bedroom. The next morning, Destiny calls Larry about a position on the show, and they would meet at noon the next day. Larry went to work and talked with Mario about the internship. At noon the following day, during the meeting with Destiny at the radio station, she would confirm that Larry is okay with talking about his personal life and how his girlfriend feels about it. She took him on a tour, and he was introduced to Meathead. Meathead was his radio name. His real name is Mike Webster, and he played football and basketball in high school and college. He was the basic jock, chick magnet type of guy. He loved being stuck on himself and was very proud of his physical conditioning. Larry and Meathead would talk about athletics in high school, Larry having wrestled and played football himself back then. After his introduction with Meathead, Larry was led to the phone screening room, which has a spot for the phone screener and a spot for the sound effects engineer. Marley was the show's sound effects engineer, a scrawny, nerdy-looking guy, almost 30 years old who had no interest in talking with Larry. Larry suspected right away that Marley would be jealous of Larry's natural talent for radio, Destiny took Larry to meet the phone screener named Sean Smith under the name Sherlock on the radio. The rumor was he earned the name Sherlock because of his investigative intuition to ensure callers stay on topic. After Larry got home that night, Vivian was out working on a report about the abandoned Pearl River steel mill and so he was home by himself. Sitting in the living room watching the television, he couldn't stop thinking about Destiny to the point where he started masturbating. He was able to pull himself together just in time before Vivian would walk into the living room. Monday 6 a.m., Larry would show up at the radio station and Destiny would introduce him to Grover, the host of the morning radio show that he would be working on. Grover's real name is Sam Schultz, a tall, lanky, single guy. His parents work in the music business by running a recording studio back home in Las Vegas where he was born and raised. During the first show broadcasting live with Larry a part of it, everything seemed to be running smooth. Destiny has a segment on the show called The Dirt Sheet, where she struggles with news stories, and Larry thought that would be a good opportunity to help Destiny with pronouncing some words she had a hard time with. 
Larry was on the final week of broadcasting school. Leading up to graduation was his final assignment. He had to do his audition tape. During his internship, Marley was getting increasingly jealous. He had been there six years and was still only a sound guy. Three months after Larry's graduation, Destiny calls and said Grover wants to meet him at the radio station. Larry ends up getting the job on the radio show and gets to interview a famous woman. But Marley had staged a fake interview with a different woman that would purposely make the interview very difficult. One Saturday, Destiny was doing an appearance. A listener approached Destiny and told her that 12 years ago, she arrested Larry for prostitution and that she was the cop that posed as the prostitute. Destiny and Grover discuss whether to bring it up or not, but eventually confront him on the show. Larry explained he did it a few times, usually pay 10 bucks for a quick blowjob. One night he was driving around, finds a lady, offers her 10 big ones, and at that moment the police jump out and he knew he was set up and was embarrassed about it. With Larry working part-time at the auto parts store and while being on the radio, Vivian started to feel like they've been drifting apart and contacted an old friend she used to do reports with and decided to have a lunch date. At the lunch date with a man named Ted, Vivian learned that Ted was recently widowed. His wife was killed by a drunk driver. After the date, Vivian left Larry a fake voicemail about being caught up at work so that they could sneak off that night and take the date to the bedroom. After three months, Larry had his own segment on the air, reviewing movies. Things were looking up for Larry. But one Friday, while everyone was discussing their weekend plans, Larry had to excuse himself because he had an accident in his ass. He shit himself, basically. While he was in the bathroom, Vivian called with an emergency saying she was bitten by a sewer rat. Larry had to race home, hoping this wouldn't be broadcast over the radio, but it was. Everyone was making poop jokes and now rat jokes. Meathead went with Larry to his house to find the rat, and when Larry found the rat, he took it out back and blew its asshole out with his grandfather's shotgun. Destiny had to go back home to attend to a funeral. In the meantime, Bob, the new producer, is introduced and becomes quick friends with Marley. The two of them plan several pranks on Larry, one of them involving a game on the radio tricking Larry into swearing. Another prank was at Groverfest where Larry was supposed to sing, but his microphone wasn't turned on and the lyrics were changed. Bob was singing the different lyrics criticizing Larry for pooping his pants. Things were civil for a few more months after that until over the Christmas break, Marley and Bob devised a subtle plan to embarrass Larry again. Marley suggested a nightclub for New Year's, and when Larry arrived with Vivian, he shortly realized this was a gay nightclub and he was extremely offended at the gesture. When the show came back on the radio after the holiday break, they ousted themselves prodding Larry about what he did during his time off. Larry and Vivian had to take a small nine-hour trip for a funeral to North Carolina, but they drove Vivian's car. So, Marley and Bob came up with a new idea for a prank. Since Larry was leaving his car, they would plant jars of baby food in his trunk and then confront him on the radio about eating baby food. After Larry returned, he pulled into the radio station, parked his car and grabbed his laptop from the trunk, not noticing any jars of baby food. Bob was standing by when Larry did this so that it'd sound reasonable for Bob saying later that he saw something in Larry's trunk. After being put on the spot while broadcasting, Larry found himself in a fury, and he protested to Bob inviting him to his car to see for himself, yelling obscenities through the hallways, things like, gay wad son of a bitch. But, after seeing with his own eyes the baby food, he attacked Bob in a Greco-Roman style that forced Bob to the ground. After multiple blows, a stone cold stunner and DDT they were eventually called into the office, Larry was almost arrested. Larry and Bob were suspended for 10 days. During those 10 days, things weren't any better for Larry. At his auto parts job, a co-worker told the boss that Larry was sleeping for 0.2 seconds. When Larry went back to the studio, there was a new event, a special event that raised over a million dollars, a mankini event. The guys wear bikinis for a car wash event to raise money. But, when Larry went to change into his normal clothes, he couldn't find his underwear. Bob had secretly stolen Larry's underwear during the Mankini event. Over the next week or so, Marley and Bob would make jokes about skid marks and poop stains until the final reveal of Larry's underwear behind caged glass, showcasing the brown streaks for the world to see. Larry lost it. He swung on the glass and after it broke, Marley asked how would he like it if someone went in there and broke his stuff like his laptop. Larry, still in a rage, swung his laptop from as high as he could and crashed it into the ground. 
When he got home, Vivian had a few bags of luggage packed, and when asked about it, she explained that she was not doing a new report or coverage, she was leaving, and she was leaving him. She reminded him about the balance of work and home, and how there was never enough time for her. But, there was always time for one thing, as he led her to the bedroom for one last round. Vivian left that morning before Larry woke up. Larry spent the day at the cemetery placing flowers on his parents' grave. Larry went home and found some military surplus supplies that his uncle bought for him. A 45 caliber pistol and an Uzi compact machine gun with two empty mags, one for each gun. He headed off to a military surplus store and bought a pair of boots, a uniform and a box of hollow point tips. When Larry returned home, he started going over his plan. On his way into the studio the next day, he called Bob to tell him that he would be a little late. He had to jump Vivian's car. At this point in time, they were unaware that they had broken up. Meanwhile, in the studio, Grover was complaining to Destiny about her toenail polish and griping about the smell. That's when Marley commented about how it was similar to Larry's stained underwear. At that moment, Larry walks into the studio. Marley makes a teasing comment about how he looks like a soldier. And actually, folks, I'm just going to read exactly what it says here because chapter 14 is awesome. Not even a second goes by, Larry pulls out both guns and starts shooting, spraying the whole studio with a rain of gunfire. Bob was killed instantly by the first burst of gunfire, but the others were severely injured and barely survived. By the time the paramedic squads responded, shell casings were scattered all over the place. Blood was splattered everywhere. Larry escaped the building, down a rarely used back stairwell, got in his car, and headed towards his planned suicide point, the Pearl River Bridge. But... Larry had other plans to deal with everyone on the show. Meanwhile, back at the radio station, there was blood everywhere, dripping from the mics, control board, computers. Grover, Destiny, and Meathead tried to duck for cover but were hit, and they were trying to administer aid to each other until the paramedics arrived. Marley was lucky enough to slip out into the studio hallway when Larry was shooting. A few bullets hit the breaker box behind Grover's chair. Sparks were flying all over and Grover's hat had metal in it. The metal conducted electricity, shocking him to death. Destiny and Meathead were very badly wounded in Larry's second hail of gunfire. The paramedics were able to get them stabilized into the hospital quickly. Marley, thinking he had outwitted Larry, was running through an alley between buildings looking for a hiding place. Larry was just around the next corner and grabbed him in a chokehold and yanked him back behind a dumpster. He pulled on his hair and started beating the shit out of him. Marley laying on the ground, pleading before Larry. Begging for mercy, Marley would say he was just busting Larry's balls, in which Larry would reply, Well, now I'm busting your balls, as he crushed Marley's testicles under his army boot. Larry took out a six-inch hunting knife and slit Marley's throat ear to ear and blood gushed out like crimson lava. Back at the studio, Sherlock wasn't around during Larry's massacre because he had to leave to take one of his legendary dumps down the hall. When he got back to the studio and saw the carnage, he slipped and fell in a pool of blood, cracking his skull open and mixing with Bob's AIDS-tainted blood, and died two days later in the hospital. Nobody knew that Bob contracted HIV from having anal and oral sex with men. By now, every news outlet in town and across the country are reporting on what happened. Larry was now being hunted by the police for days after the initial shooting. Larry then found out which gym Meathead works out at and had an idea to set a certain weight machine at 245 pounds. Sure enough, Meathead got to the gym and set the machine at 245 pounds and on the first lift. The bomb detonated and shards of metal, blood and guts went flying everywhere. Destiny, not knowing what happened to the others, was driven home from the hospital by a friend. What she didn't know was that while she was at the hospital, Larry snuck into her house and doused her tampons with cyanide poison. Destiny went to use the bathroom, grabbed a poisoned tampon just as Larry had planned, and stuck it into her pussy. When she turned on the TV, there was wall-to-wall -wall coverage on every news outlet in the country. She was so shocked at all the bloody carnage Larry had left behind. She started to shake so bad that her heartbeat skyrocketed, causing a blood vessel to burst and mix with the cyanide. She died within an hour after the tampon is used. When the police eventually raided Larry's place, they found a hand-drawn blueprint of the radio station building, the surrounding area, and a list of items Larry needed in order to carry out his plan. Unknown to the police... Larry was hiding out in his uncle's hunting cabin deep in the woods overlooking the city. His uncle is a retired U.S. Marine and he had taught Larry how to hunt, fish, and live off the land. 
At sunrise, Larry made his way to the bridge just as he planned. The moment he got out of his car, he was surrounded by police with guns drawn. He stepped onto the railing and paused as an officer with a megaphone tried to convince Larry to step down and surrender. Thoughts went racing through his mind of what led to this. All Larry wanted was a career in broadcasting. Two of his co-workers didn't like him. His ex-girlfriend dumps him because he wasn't prepared for marriage. He dropped an F-bomb on the air, beat the shit out of that faggoty pole smoker Bob and nearly got fired. Then he killed six people in the span of a week. Larry was zoned out, not even hearing the police. He looked to the sky. It was a gloomy, hazy day. He could see a storm coming in from the distance. This is not what Larry wanted to do today. Larry thought to himself, man, this is perfect cranking weather. When out of nowhere, the sharp tone from a police megaphone shouted, get the fuck down, instantly snapping him out of his daydream. But as if he was about to comply, turned and faced the police with guns drawn. He held up his fist and then flipped the middle finger. Police would later say that his last words were, bobble my dong, as he jumped off the bridge, falling 150 feet to his death in the valley below. His body splattered all over a moving car below, causing an epic pile up on the road. The driver of that car was Vivian, Larry's ex-girlfriend, who was on her way to Los Angeles. She was instantly killed by the impact of Larry's body. What Larry was hiding from the show was that he knew Vivian was bisexual. She left him for a woman living in Los Angeles. Police and paramedics all responded to the scene and pulled their lifeless bodies from the wreck. For some strange, mysterious reason, Larry, even though he was dead, had this grin on his face. It was like he was finally going home. His uncle came to the Pearl City morgue to claim Larry's body and prepare it for burial. He found the suicide note Larry wrote the night before and this is what the note said. All I wanted in life is to be successful. I tried very hard. Certain people treated me like I was some doormat or were just jealous of me. I made my own mistakes in life that I regretted. Whatever happens to me as a result of the events today, I wish to fulfill my parents' final request in their will that I'm to be buried with them. There was a second item found in the mangled wreckage. It was a manuscript of a short novel about a fictional person getting into radio. This person gets picked on endlessly and loses it. It tells the details of how he murders everyone. Anyone listening to this story would have known to stop fucking with Larry before it was too late. It's too bad the police found the manuscript after Larry committed suicide. If only someone had a clue of the story before he killed everyone. If only someone was lucky enough to listen to this story. Before the rampage, all of this would have been prevented. It would have served as a warning to everyone. And to think, Larry Jaroque was writing a book about a fictional character named Jeffrey LaRoque. At the funeral home, Larry's casket was closed. His body was so mangled that you couldn't recognize it or even want to look at it. At the cemetery, under a gray sky, light rain, and a slight rumble of thunder, Larry's friends and family gathered at the grave site. Finally, and for all eternity, Larry Jaroque was not still standing. The entire universe let out a collective so. So, that's gonna do it. I hope you enjoyed this little voice cloning storytelling test. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and thanks for watching.